What's up everyone, Steven here from TechMaker. In this episode, we're gonna kick off a brand new series. I was listening to an interview with Mark Cuban the other day and he made a point about NFTs that I thought was really interesting. He was talking about one use case uh, would be to have some sort of digital book platform where people buy and trade books um, as NFTs. I haven't carefully thought through all of the sort of business aspects of that and whether it's necessarily a good idea. I think you could say that, you know, it might be cool to be able to prove that you own a first edition of a particular book and this sort of thing. So maybe that's a great idea. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But in any case, it gave me an idea for a series because I don't think it would be that difficult to actually build what he was talking about. And so I thought, hey, let's do it uh, all together. So that's what we're gonna do here. So in this episode, what I want to do is basically just kind of outline what I'm thinking right now about how to approach the problem. And in the next episode, we're gonna get started writing some actual smart contracts for the NFTs. And in actual fact, I'm gonna quit using the term NFT because I think NFT is something that people are sort of uh, overusing right now without necessarily understanding or or being maybe specific enough in how they use it. So NFT is non-fungible token. And so you can think of like something like that. It's a one-off, like it's not equally tradable for another one, um, right? So if you have like a dollar bill, it's fungible because one dollar bill is identical um, to another one. I mean, in theory, right? Like you could trade one for one and feel like you haven't lost or gained anything. So that's fungibility. If you have a house that's not fungible for any other house, um, even if you had two identical houses, you can't have them be identical in terms of like, you know, the property that they sit on or anything like that. So if you switch those two houses, no matter how similar they are to each other, they're not identical. Um, and uh, that's kind of the difference between fungible and non-fungible. So when people talk about NFTs, they're really talking about my thing is totally different from your thing. And so if we trade them, there's no way that it's a perfectly equal trade. So in the case of books, let's say that you're the author of a book and you want to create 100 first edition copies. Um, now you could do that in different ways. Maybe you could write a personal message in each one or something like that. And in that case, they would not be fungible. But if you just made 100 first edition books and these are digital, so they can't get damaged or anything like that, I don't see a reason why those copies are not fungible within themselves. So if you make a second edition, that would not be fungible for the first edition. So this all gets a little bit complicated, and fortunately, there is an Open Zeppelin contract, which is from ERC 1155, which solves this problem for us pretty much perfectly. So as you can see in the opening line, ERC 1155 is a novel token standard that aims to take the best from previous standards to create a fungibility agnostic and gas efficient token contract. And it draws ideas from ERC-20 and 721. So ERC-20 is fungible tokens. Like if you buy tokens uh, on Ethereum, any kind of token, pretty much it's ERC-20. So those are all tradable within themselves. They're all fungible. And then ERC-721 is the NFT standard contract. So if we scroll down, um, we'll see a little code snippet. It gives us an idea. And um, it might be helpful if you're totally unfamiliar with ERC-20 or ERC-721. You can either after this video or you could pause now, go just watch a couple of quick videos around the web on that. I do have some ERC-20 videos, but mine are a little bit more in depth, kind of uh, exploring some of the different aspects. So if you just kind of want a simple overview, maybe just do a quick search and you'll see some stuff. But um, we can kind of get an idea looking at this here. So we're importing this ERC-1155 contract. We're saying game items is ERC-1155. And then basically what we're doing here with these constants is we're setting up some IDs. Um, so one of the big deals with NFTs um, in, as opposed to fungible tokens is that uh, they have an ID. So instead of saying like, um, you know, just what's your balance of some token, each token gets its own ID. So the difference here is that what we're doing when we look at this, we can see that we're minting different numbers 
of of different things. So we're we're minting like gold ten times or ten to the eighteen. We're minting silver ten to the twenty seven. We're minting one Thor's hammer. So in this case, Thor's hammer would be an NFT. There's only one of them, so it's totally unique. Um, we're minting a bunch of swords. We're minting a bunch of shields, and so. There's a couple of things to note here. So first of all, um, what's really interesting is this URL with the ID being interpolated in here. Um, so this is something that basically what we need to do is we need to have some kind of API or something where we have some JSON where if we pass in the API and then we parse in the ID, which is coming from up here, we'll get info about that particular thing. So for example, we would have something that's like game.example API item 0.json, and that should have all the metadata about gold. Um, so we'll get into that later. Um, we're going to use Aleph to host our, our data, and that's going to allow us to be pretty much completely decentralized. Like I don't want any aspect of this to be centralized. The only thing that might be at the end is like the user interface. But what this series is effectively going to show you how to do is build your own user interface on top of whatever backend that we create here. So, you know, in that sense, it is totally decentralized because anybody could come along and just create, you know, a little React app and sit on top of the exact same system and, and operate on the data and all of that stuff. So in that sense, I think it's very close to purely decentralized. Um, if we come down here, we'll see an example of what some of the JSON data needs to look like. So these are things that we're not storing on chain. You can see like the image here isn't stored on chain for Thor's hammer. Um, so in our case, what we're gonna wanna do is effectively upload like a PDF of the book um, to uh, let's say Aleph, which I think in the end gets stored on IPFS, and that is going to allow us to set up some JSON metadata on Aleph, which is going to have a link to that file, and then our we're going to have to sort of organize the IDs coming into our contract or update the data on Aleph to reference it properly or something like that. I haven't fully figured that out yet, so I'm still kind of in the process of mapping this out, but essentially um, our smart contract is gonna have to have a URL that points back to where the metadata lives because we don't wanna store all of that on chain. If all of this sounds slightly confusing so far, don't worry about it too much. It'll become more clear as we work through this. Um, the, the second thing and the last thing I really wanted to point out on this contract is the reason we're using this ERC-1155 is because really it's a contract that manages sets of tokens. So if you think about it and you just look what we're doing here, we're minting five different tokens, which this contract all tracks. And we have this useful way of handling the metadata, which is handled really behind the scenes for you. So, um, and we'll, we'll look into exactly how that works um, in the next one or two episodes. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was essentially what we're going to do is we're not going to use this constructor and all these constants. What we're going to do, first of all, we're going to have to develop our little or use maybe the open Zeppelin counter, which is really basic, but just kind of keep track of our own IDs. They're hard coding these IDs. What we're going to do is every time somebody publishes a book, um, we're going to increment the ID and keep track of it like that in our back end. Um, but the thing is, what we're going to need to do is, and it's sort of implied in what I just said, we're going to need to create a publish mechanism. And that publish mechanism is going to take in like uh, maybe the book title, um, maybe, may, may not even need that. That might just be in the metadata, but it's going to take in the price that somebody wants to sell the book for. And we could actually also, and I think I might do this, we might give them like some sort of list of currencies to choose from. So you might be able to say like, all right, I'm going to sell this book for 50 USDC. You could also put it in ETH if you wanted to, or Chainlink or Matic or, or whatever. So we may provide like a list of addresses, um, essentially that they could choose from so they could pick which token they want to get paid in we could go more complicated than that but i don't really want to 
Um, that's kind of a cool thing in and of itself. Um, so you'll, whenever you publish a book, you'll say how many tokens, which currency you want for it. Um, and then you'll say how many copies to produce. So let's say you're doing the example from earlier and you're saying, I'm going to make 100 first edition copies of this book. You're a famous author. So you have a following and you're going to put a big price tag on it, a thousand bucks or something like that. Okay. Um, you could do that. Um, so we need that publish function and then we're going to need a corresponding like purchase function so that people can buy a copy of the book. And, uh, last probably there may be more to it than this. I've, I've mapped all this out on paper. Um, but what inevitably happens is I map it out. And then once we start building it, I'll encounter something I didn't quite think about yet. But, uh, kind of the last thing that I have going on in my head is we need to have the ability for people to resell it. Um, so they could put their own price on it. So imagine all 100 copies of our first edition book sell for a thousand bucks. A little bit of time goes by and somebody wants to sell theirs for 2000 or whatever number, right? We want to allow that to happen. So there needs to be some kind of marketplace. If we jump over to sketch.io, um, this is all from a previous series. Let me go ahead and pause the video and delete all this stuff. So um what i'm gonna do is basically just see if i can map out a quick data modeling they have shapes i feel like i asked that question last time um what all do we got in here star give me some circles okay so let's make a few of these all right i think i had like this this like editor is this is a cool platform but it's like really hard to get used to it for me anyway for some reason so what i want to have is basically like an account right that's that's sort of the default thing you have to have um because that's your ethereum account or whatever polygon account it's all kind of the same thing um we're gonna have a book right and the book is something that's actually going to be owned by the account so in this sense like and we'll we'll have to make this a little bit more clear in in the code somehow but like the book being owned by the account like this means that you created the book basically like you're the book owner you're the author um and uh, I don't know exactly how we're going to map that out just yet, um, but we need to make that clear in the code that this means you are the author. Okay, so then if we come down here, what this is in, in the way I'm thinking about it is a book version. And the reason for that is if you think about it conceptually, um, like let's say you know you're by you're you wrote a book called Lord of the Rings or whatever, right? Like. The first edition of that is the same book as the second and third and fourth editions of that. Even if you make changes to the book and they're different, just sort of in the way that we talk about books and we think about books, it's the same book. It's just a different version. Um, so the book version is going to be what we uh, actually put in our smart contract. So when we mint something here, we're actually going to mint a book version. And so what we may include in here is actually the original book ID. What that would allow us to do is write some kind of method that uh, returns back a list of all of the versions of a particular book um, that have been minted. Um, it would probably have to take in an address too. So so when we publish a book, and again, I'm kind of riffing here, just kind of thinking through this. That's what I said I was gonna do in this video. So whenever we publish a book, what's gonna to have to happen is we're gonna to have to say the message.sender, which is whoever executed the transaction, is the owner of that book. So we're gonna to need to do that in order for people to authenticate that actually, yeah, the book that's published here is from the author that I think it's from. We need to basically that's your way of verifying that you're really the the real publisher so there, there's some ways we can get around some of this stuff and and uh, model this so that we handle the security um there's different approaches to it i haven't figured out exactly what i'm going to do yet so let me not get too deep into the weeds with all of that here 
Um, but just suffice it to say that there's a discussion to be had around that. And then the last thing I'm gonna have is what I'm, this is gonna be a bit wordy, a book version instance. So when you actually, and we won't ever use this in the user interface um, because that's too technical and wordy, um, but actually a book version instance, in my opinion, we can make it belong to all three of these things. So it's gonna have an account ID, which is the person who bought the book. Um, it's gonna have a book ID, so it knows which book it's talking about. And then it's gonna have a book version ID. So if I buy you know, the first edition of Lord of the Rings, I'm gonna know that, okay, it, I own it um, because I bought it. So it has my account address connected to it. It's gonna have the book ID, Lord of the Rings, and then it's gonna have the book version ID, the first edition. Um, technically, this line here is sort of denormalized. Like you could just point to the book version and then pull the book ID off the book version, but sometimes I just go ahead and stick this here because I know I'm gonna wanna talk to the book from the book version instance. Um, so it's, it's, you know, just kind of my way of doing things sometimes. So I'm kind of maybe pre-optimizing that, but whatever. It's my class, so you can do it if you want or don't do it if you don't want. Um, cool, so that's the model. A lot of this data is gonna be stored on ALEF. The book version is gonna be in the smart contract. Um, I haven't 100% figured all this out yet, but that's kind of the gist. We're gonna start by writing the smart contract and then we're gonna build out a React application um, that uses ALEF on the back end for some of the extra data that we need to keep track of. That's the plan. And uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. I think this is gonna be really cool. Uh, I know this is kind of a little bit of a, a dry, non-coding episode, just kind of talking through some things. Um, so if you made it this far, I appreciate you watching. And uh, in the next episode, we will jump into some code. So I will talk to you over there.